the operation of transformers remains a frequently discussed topic. Why that is the case while it shouldn't be, we'll find out in this video. Expect an answer that sets you at peace. Before we start, we narrow down our considerations to voltage transformers. Also, we use electric wire that has no resistance. So if we apply voltage to an ideally conducting wire, we can expect an infinite current. Which of course is not possible. What this situation tells us, Kirchhoff's voltage law, KVL, is violated. You cannot connect a voltage source to a wire. This situation is different when you do not use a simple wire, but if that wire is shaped as conductor loop. Why is this situation different? Because there is a second way how a voltage can have an effect. Apart from causing current over an ohmic resistor, it can create flux over a closed loop, according to Faraday's law. In other words, voltage is translated to magnetic flux, flux change to be precise. Let's have a deeper look on it to clarify the situation. Part 1. The ideal coil as flux translating electrical component. We return to the beginning. We already know that you can't apply voltage to a short circuit. Using Kirchhoff on this shows the situation. Finite voltage across zero resistance leads to infinite current. There is voltage in this loop, but it apparently does not add up to zero. Still, the voltage loop that follows Kirchhoff's is indicated in green. Second configuration. We form a loop out of the wire and discover it is possible to apply voltage across an ideal wire. So our green area adheres to KVL. And according to Faraday, that voltage is translated to flux within this loop. Ok, what's next? We use an inductor, which is something like multiple loops. So all is fine for KVL within the green area. But we will not look into the inductor, since I have not colored this area as valid for KVL. Now the sad truth. Inside the loop, which is indicated in red, KVL is not valid. Why? Because voltage within a closed loop does not add up to zero. Now let's look at this very carefully. We start at point A. And first thing, we collect minus V, while going to B. Then we follow the wire walking along the red path. Strange thing, while walking the red path, we will not encounter any voltages. So after we have walked a full turn, we come back to the spot A, but we still have voltage minus V. That is a clear sign Kirchhoff is no longer valid here. There is no way we walk around the red area demanding KVL to help us. As stated already, Faraday helps us out here. The voltage at the entry of the loop is translated to flux. So there is no need for voltages along the red path. Or more to the point, there is no need for electric field strength multiplied by distance along the path from B to A that results in voltage. Let's go back to configuration 2. We said voltage is translated to flux, thus ending KVL and letting Faraday take over. Let's assume we prevent the creation of magnetic flux. Can it be done? Well, not directly, because flux is there when voltage is present, at least Faraday tells us so. Let's do it the hard way and place an ideally conducting ring exactly over the area the magnetic flux is expected to appear. That closed loop prevents the creation of magnetic flux because it follows Faraday as well. Faraday tells us 
when there is no voltage within a closed loop, and how could there be without resistances? Then there is no magnetic flux change. So we have stolen the possibility of voltage flux translation from the black loop. With this situation, we end up in configuration 1. There is voltage, but it can nowhere be applied to causing infinite current. What happens if the same wire is wound around the same space? Well, in that case, Faraday can be reversed, means since both wires have the same flux, then they must have the same voltage. It is important to understand this. These two loops are chained to each other via their common magnetic field. Because of that one magnetic field, there is one electrical value that corresponds with it. That is the voltage per turn, the VT value. Let's further dwell on Faraday's law. If we provide a sinusoidal voltage from a voltage source, such as mains voltage, the flux is set in its value and shape and is not changed by whatever happens in the magnetic field. No matter if something withdraws energy from the magnetic field, adds energy to this magnetic field or changes its properties, e.g. by inserting iron cores or removing them. Because that is the law, Faraday's law, the voltage per turn defines the magnetic flux or, to further emphasize this statement, an electric voltage source translates into a magnetic flux source. So we got that connection between flux and voltage. But how much current do I have on the electrical side? It doesn't work without current, does it? For that, we have to take a peek on the magnetic part. Generally, the amount of magnetomotive force is determined by the amount of flux that passes through a certain magnetic resistance, also known as reluctance. So, flux is set, and the reluctance is determined from the material in the setting the flux passes through. Since this is a spatial structure, the calculation is somewhat complex, so you leave it to an FEM program. Anyway, we get a reluctance for this configuration, and therefore it is clear how much magnetomotive force F is required for this given flux. The MMF is exactly the value that is translated to current using Ampere's law, and therefore appears as current I from the voltage source. So if we change the permeability in this configuration by inserting iron in the magnetic path, the reluctance decreases. Therefore, the same amount of flux requires less MMF now. So the electric current decreases. Now we know how voltage and current in a loop are connected via the magnetic field. We saw the same commonly shared magnetic flux for more than one turn with regard to voltage. What happens with current when used multiple times? Every time a turn carrying the same current is laid around the same area and space, the magnetic force increases by this amount of current. Therefore, the total MMF is the electric current times number of turns. So we could have guessed why this value is coined ampere turns. Since the ampere turns quantify the MMF, this is the available magnetic voltage Vm at the same time. Let's see now how we can look at all this from a pure electrical view, ignoring all the interesting things that happen in the magnetic field for voltage to current translation. The current translates to the magnetomotive force F. This in turn can be calculated as multiplication of reluctance times flux. 
The flux is determined as the integral of the voltage per turn. The inverse of the reluctance is the inductivity for one turn. And voila! This is the generally applicable current voltage equation for wire loops, aka inductors with one turn. It's getting even more interesting when there is more than one turn. The current is now defined as MMF divided by the number of wire turns. Still, the MMF is reluctance times flux. Now the flux is determined as the integral of the voltage per turn. The number of turns is now multiplied in a denominator. Now that we have the total voltage in the integral, we replace the reluctance Rm with its reciprocal to get 1 divided by Al. The square of the number of turns multiplied by Al is the inductance. And there we go. This is the generally valid voltage current dependency of inductances without considering the magnetic field.